Hello everyone. In this talk, I plan to compare the development of semiconductor manufacturing in three nations, India, Korea and Taiwan. Please note that this is an extended version of a talk I gave at the Weibo Summit in 2020 in the session Manufacturing Ecosystem for Conventional Semiconductor Based Process Technologies. This was the agenda of that session. As you can see, the speakers were from India and abroad, also from academia and the government. Let me start with a disclaimer, as some of you may not know me personally or professionally. I'm not a professional historian or an economist. I have more than 20 years of combined teaching, research and industrial experience on semiconductors. I have an amateur interest in the history of technology and economic history. Please note that this is not an original research. There is a lot of literature on Korea and Taiwan since the late 1980s. Finally, the views expressed here in our mind and they do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of Electrical Engineering or IIT Madras. I would say preparing talks like this is like writing a non-fiction book. One has to finally draw a line and accept the fact that there is no space and time to include all the interesting stuff. For the curious listeners, I have given my references as footnotes and also at the end. Here is the outline of my talk. First, I will briefly talk about the great divergence and the second divergence. Next, we will have a quick look at the semiconductor manufacturing and its worldwide status. Next, I will discuss the development trajectory of Korea, Taiwan and India. Here I spend some time about the history of each country to understand the big picture, the choices Korea and Taiwan made and also to understand whether those choices are available to us today for nations like us if we decide to follow their path. Then I will take a look at the India Semiconductor Mission in the light of what we know from the history. Finally, I will summarize my talk. Please note that although displays are, are part of India Semiconductor Mission, it is beyond the scope of this talk and my expertise. This talk is around 80 minutes. If you are someone with a short attention span who prefers to watch 20 minute videos, I would recommend watching this in four sessions. If you want an even shorter version, I would recommend watching just the introduction and the summary. Please understand that this is a complex topic and one should not give in to the temptation for, to look for monocausal explanations and silver bullet solutions. Before talking about Korea and Taiwan, I would like to talk about the great divergence. This is one of the misleading ch charts which has launched many dubious claims. This shows the share of world GDP by different countries over the last 700 years. So here, China is shown as the, uh, this blue and India is the green. As per this graph, India and China had held a large share of world's GDP and they fell behind Europe and America in the last two centuries here. But the fact is that until about 1800, the vast majority of people on this planet were poor and they were in a Malthusian trap. However, this difference in the share of share disappears if one considers per capita GDP. The per capita GDP of most nations was similar until around 1500, as shown here. That means the world share of GDP shows only the distribution of population until the end of Middle Ages. Great divergence is a dramatic gain in wealth, power and influence of Europe compared to the other great Eurasian cultures from the 18th and 19th century. It, it is worth noting that the pattern of declining GDP per, per capita during the 17th and 18th centuries occurred in China as well as India, India as well. The normal uh, definition of modern economic growth requires a positive growth of population and GDP per capita at the same time. In the pre-modern era, different empires experienced efflorescence, which is nothing but a short golden age of prosperity, which lasted for a few decades. 
this might have caused a marginal increase in the income per head however that will eventually get saturated by the increase in population this happened in song china renaissance italy or golden age holland all ancient economies were organic they were dependent on plant photosynthesis to provide food raw materials and energy this was true for energy so heat energy was derived from burning wood and mechanical energy by human and animal muscle the flow of energy from the sun captured by plant photosynthesis was the basis of all production and consumption great britain was the first country to escape these limitations by increased use of vast stock of energy contained in coal initially as a source of heat energy but eventually also of for me of mechanical energy through the invention of steam engine it became the first country which experienced both population growth and significant growth in income per capita during the same half century you may be wondering what is the connection between the great divergence and semiconductor history industry in korea and taiwan the great divergence occurred in the 18th and 19th century however the second divergence happened in a few decades that is a story of how east asian countries like south korea and taiwan leave from south asia and many other countries in the ladder of economic hierarchy i call this jump the second divergence let us why let us see why i picked these two countries among others let us compare the per capita gdp figures of india taiwan and korea they were as poor as us in the 1950 as shown by the gdp per capita figures from the madison project database both were also colonies of japan for close to 35 to 50 years both are all, both are smaller than the state of tamil nadu in area i didn't pick japan which was already an industrial power before the second world war in a span of 50 to 70 years following major restoration in 1868 japan bucked the trend of the great divergence which affected the rest of the asia they learned from the west in just a couple of decades it turned from a feudal state run by warrior aristocracy to a modern industrial empire though they were the best students who quickly learned from the west that didn't stop them from becoming another imperial power and committed atrocities in east asia and southeast asia korea and taiwan grew economically by seeing the path laid out by jap by the japanese in the 1950s they followed the same path one or two decades later semiconductors played a big role in their growth i also excluded other asian tigers like hong kong and singapore which are port come offshore financial centers they had a very small agriculture sector and they didn't need to worry about how to prepare a large population employed in farming once the country moved to manufacturing or services though hong kong was the first east asian country which started semiconductor assembly and packaging operations it had little success in leveraging and advancing its technological capability and hence value addition although singapore has a lot of semiconductor presence it is mostly due to multinational companies the perhaps sole big local player chartered semiconductor manufacturing was acquired by global foundries around 10 years back let us take a quick look at the semiconductor manufacturing semiconductors are sophisticated products made using semiconducting materials like silicon or gallium nitride through a complex process in a highly specialized manufacturing facility examples of semiconductors are processors used in computers and smartphones dram sensors flash memory discrete power devices etc please note although tf tft based displays and solar photovoltaics are made using semiconducting materials they are counted as a separate product category please note that here semiconductor is not used as a category or a definition of a material as found in textbooks or taught in classrooms but as a separate product category the pervasive nature of semiconductors in our everyday lives was realized by many or many only when there was a shortage semiconductor manufacturing involves a complex network of companies located in different countries semiconductor manufacturing has three distinct components they are design front end wafer fabrication and back end 
packaging and testing. Some companies specialize in one, while others engage in more than one activity. In design, companies come up with the new products and specifications to meet customer needs, and they reduce these ideas to particular logic and circuit designs. They use their own intellectual property or license it, with, license it from some, somewhere else and create the design in the form of a circuit layout using electronic design automation tools. These are sent to the front end fabrication where fabs transfer the patterns in the layout to create microscopic device structures and electronic circuits on mostly silicon wafers. Back end assembly and testing and packaging is where the wafers are sliced into individual chips engaged, engaged in packages and put through a quality control process. Both front end and back end processes uh, re require highly sophisticated manufacturing equipment, wafers, ultra pure gases, and chemicals. Among the different processes, manufacturing is the most capital intensive process, while design is the most value added. Now, let us look at the current worldwide share of semiconductor manufacturing. Korea and Taiwan have close to 60% wafer fabrication capacity for the leading edge nodes that is less than 40 nanometer and around 40% if you count all processing nodes. This is really an astonishing leap for a country which was very poor 70 years back. In 2021, South Korea held 22% and Taiwan 9% of the total worldwide IC market. You might have noticed India is nowhere in this picture. Almost all major semiconductor suppliers have outsourced some of their engineering design to their development centers in India. Though there is a lot of value addition, it cannot be reported as India's share as their headquarters is, are abroad. It may surprise you that all three countries had started similarly, yet they diverged so much. Now, let us start with a short history of South Korea till the 1960s. For hundreds of years, Korea was, a China, was China's vassal state. The, the, the Korean officials regarded Chinese emperor as the only emperor and sought his legitimacy. It has been an ethnically and linguistically uniform society since the 17th century. Korea in 18th century was a politically stable and prosperous Confucian kingdom. It was only the intrusion of Western imperial powers into the East Asia in the, mid in the mid 19th century that brought a century of turmoil and gave birth to modern Korea. It came under the heel of imperial Japan at the start of 20th century. Once the Second World War on the Western Front with Germany was over, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan and it began an assault along the northern part of its empire. Fearing that the Soviets were in a position to occupy the entire Korean Peninsula, the Americans drew up a proposal to prevent all of it from falling under the Soviet control. The plan was to divide the Korean Peninsula into two equal sized zones along the 38th parallel. When North Korea attempted to reunify the country in 1950, foreign powers again intervened in Korean affairs. The result was the Korean War, which made the division between the two halves permanent. North and South Korea saw itself as in competition with others to demonstrate that it deserves to, it deserves to represent the entire Korean nation and to be in the better position to reunify the country. Yet, while sharing many of the same goals, they followed different paths to reach them and thus they become ever more divergent societies. At first, North Korea appeared to be the more successful of the two states in building a modern strong, self-reliant industrial state. It rapidly recovered from the Korean War and in two decades, it became the most urbanized and industrialist country in Asia after Japan. South Korea, after an unpromising start, characterized by political corruption, instability and poverty, ended a period of high economic growth after a military coup led by General Park Chung-hee in 1961. He ruled from 1963 to 1979 and was the person responsible for Korea's growth. At the time of military coup, Lee Byung-chul, 
the founder of Samsung was in Korea. He learned that he was at the very top of the list of corrupt businessmen to be investigated by the new regime. He returned to Seoul and made a deal with the general Park Chunky that all of his missed, uh, past misdeeds would be forgiven as long as he would be willing to work with the new government in transforming Korea into an industrial nation. So here you can see a picture of both of them. The left, the, uh, the left is a Park Chunky and the right, uh, Lee Bim Chul is on the right side. In 1962, Korea implemented the first five-year development plan with well-defined in industrial and infrastructural targets. The state set the goals, pushed industries into new areas, then cha they channeled the loan on favorable terms to private businesses that competed to co complete them. The state also assisted companies with the tax breaks, export assistance, favorable rates on state-owned railroads, utilities, and in another, other ways. But the state help was based on the performance of private companies. Those like Honda and Sam or Samsung that proved efficient were favored over their less effective competitors. These favored companies grew into giant conglomerates known as chaebols. To promote efficiency, Park made sure that made sure that there, there were at least two competing firms, firms in each sector. The central agency was a presidential house where a war room was maintained to monitor export performance and monthly meetings. This was done to ensure that the growth targets were met, investment channeled according to strategic directions, and action was being taken when the targets were missed. Despite being an authoritarian ruler, General Park never acquired full dictatorial powers. A key factor limiting Park's power was South, South Korea's continued dependency on USA for military support and as a prime market for exports. South Korea also saw how Japan made its economic recovery during the Korean War. It saw the same opportunity for development during the Vietnam War. For Korea's military support in the Vietnam War, US gave economic aid including a $150 million a development loan. The economic aid Korea received from the US was responsible for funding South Korea's industrialization efforts. South Korea's largest conglomerates also got lucrative business contracts from the U.S. military. Because of the alliances U.S. had with Japan and South Korea, the U.S. played an important role in normalizing the relations between South Korea and Japan. This brought long-lasting economic benefits to South Korea in terms of financial support from Japan and also access to the Japanese economy. When General Park signed a peace treaty and established full diplomatic relations with Japan in 1965, it ignited mass protest on fear that Korea would once again become economically dependent on its former colonial master. Yet, the regime's decision to override nationalist sentiment meant that the Japanese investments started flowing into Korea at a time when labor costs in Japan were rising. That was a short history of Korea. Now, let us see how electronics manufacturing has started in Korea. Until 1965, the Korean electronics industry was in a very rudimentary state. The export share of the industry was only about 0.9% of the whole of the manufacturing industry. The only meaningful export product was transistor radios. This situation then changed radically soon after the US investment started. Robert Noyes then the head of the Fairchild Semiconductors started assembly of transistors in Hong Kong and later in Korea to take advantage of the very low labor charges compared to that of that in California. These outsourcing operations only did only uh, uh, did in, uh, in the uh, simple assembly and testing of transistors. But, so this was primarily aimed for export. They what? But for doing these operations, they imported all the necessary materials and production equipment. In the 60s, government encouraged foreign direct investment in semiconductors primarily to increase Korea's exports rather than to obtain technology for Korean firms. And in fact, little de technology diffusion occurred because US companies did only the labor intensive and peripheral stages of production in Korea. Samsung's electronic division was started in 1970. Its first product was black and white television sets. 
The electronic industry was selected by General Park's regime as one of the six industries to be promoted under the Heavy and Chemical Industry Plan in 1973. This was despite the fact that the electronics was neither heavy nor chemical. Samsung's entry into electronics was strongly supported by the Korean government, but it was bitterly opposed by the Korean electronics industry at that time. They feared that Samsung may become dominant and would push the smaller firms out. However, Samsung raised the technical standards of the industry, forcing incumbent firms to raise their technical levels or perish. The overall goal of the heavy and the chemical industry policy was to encourage large firms and provide them with the preferential loans at below market interest rates, tax reductions and other incentives. The important condition attached to these policy loans was that the receiving firms must export their products almost from the beginning and prove their export performance. This kind of condition for export performance worked as a positive pressure for the subsidy receiving firms to increase their production efficiency in order to be able to sell their products in the export market. Sometime in the mid 1970s, South Korea surpassed North Korea by every measure of economic strength and well being of its citizens. In 1974, Samsung Group expanded into semiconductor business by acquiring Korea Semiconductor, which was on the verge of bankruptcy. Its semiconductor development was initially led by moonlighting experienced Japanese engineers who came to work in Korea on the weekends. To enhance Korea's own technological capacity, the government established in 1976 a new public research institution, the Korea Institute of Electronics Technology, KIT. KIT was later renamed as Electronics and Tele Telecommunication Research Institute after its merger with another institution. Its charter gave it responsibility for planning and coordinating semiconductor R&D, importing, assimilating and disseminating foreign technologies, providing technical assistance to Korean firms, and undertaking market research. It had three divisions. Each division was headed by a Korean with both academic training and industry experience in the United States. Through its license office in California, KIT obtained equipment and technology licenses, built contacts with US semiconductor firms, and importantly, created a network among Korean researchers working in the US semiconductor companies. Through this network, KIT was able to help Korean firms to identify particular individuals with the skills they need and either enlist their help while remaining in the US or relocate them to work in Korea. KIT opened Korea's first pilot wafer fabrication facility in 1978 in a joint venture with the US semiconductor firm VLSA Technology. It was an, it was an LSA facility which could make 16K DRAM. In 1980s, the South Korea began a transition into a democratic society as the totalitarian leadership of the North Korea was evolving into a family-run isolated state. In the early 1980s, the, South, the, the government began to restructure the telecommunication industry. The aim was to integrate upstream and downstream segments imitating the Japan structure of semiconductor companies being divisions of larger electronics companies. Government announced a multi-billion dollar expansion and modernization of telecommunications infrastructure, most of which would be, would be guaranteed to semiconductor companies. They could enter joint ventures with the multinational firms by offering lucrative business in telecommunication in return for transferring telecommunications and semiconductor technology. They, they were also able to cross subsidize their own efforts in semiconductors from the profits on telecommunications. It was decided that the push into the VLSA activities should be led by the private sector, leveraging on the advanced technologies abroad. In February 1983, in a speech known as the Tokyo, Tokyo Declaration, uh, Lee Byung-chul, the founder of the Samsung, he declared that he declared in Korea, in sorry, declared in Tokyo that the uh, Samsung would enter the semiconductor industry and publicly declared its intention to become the number one DRAM maker. At that time, the Japanese were the leaders in the DRAM business. Samsung chose DRAM as the major product as it has more market than SRAM, but it is less design intensive than the application specific ICs, ASICs. 
it brought 64 k uh, kilobyte design technology from micron which was just started uh, three years back and process technology from sharp it hired experienced korean americans from the us and they were paid three to four times more than the president of the company so this is a picture of the ground breaking ceremony of the gigum fab which was constructed in just six months this was samsung's first vlsa facility so samsung's founder lee byung chul you can see him third from the left Around four billion dollars was invested for DRAM in the 1983-89 by the leading DRAM makers Samsung, Hyundai, Goldstar, and Daewoo in their R&D effort. This became the largest R&D effort Korea had seen till then. By the time Korean firms had actually produced marketable products in the mid 1980s, the world semiconductor industry was heading into a cyclical recession, and the DRAM prices dropped. The early sales in the US, US market were also bad. These setbacks prompted a furious debate in the government and business ranks in Korea. The Economic Planning Board, EPB, backed by the banks, argued that the Korea had no future in this risky business. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, MTI, on, on the other hand, maintained that the difficulties were simply due to the cyclical downturn and the demand would pick up. That was also a time when US, major U.S. DRAM makers lost their business to the Japanese and they decided to exit the DRAM business. Korean newcomers tasted their first real success in the mid-1980s. It was made possible through a window of opportunity which opened by chance due to the escalating trade conflicts between the U.S. and Japan. In 1986, Japan and the U.S. settled their trade differences by limiting Japanese access to the U.S. market and setting a floor price for the semiconductor products. Both these aspects of the agreement favored Korean producers who were ready with the new products. They had greater access to the U.S. markets and the prices were higher than what they had anticipated. The boom in the personal computers fuel also fueled their demand for their chips in 1987. In 1993, Samsung became the world leader in DRAM, and by 1994, Korean firms had acquired around 40% of the world market for 16 meg DRAMs. The Korean DRAM industry later survived the twin shock of the steep fall in DRAM prices and the Asian financial crisis during 1995 to 1998. In 1996, South Korea joined the OECD, an organization of developed countries. So, it was a symbol of South Korea moving from a third world status to a first world status. Samsung similarly closed the gap in the logic process technology. In 2004, Samsung joined the IBM alliance uh, uh, on the 90 nanometer CMOS logic technology development program. In 2007, Intel decided not to become the primary chip supplier for the iPhone and Apple decided to get it designed and manufactured at Samsung. Apple didn't have an internal chip design team at that time. Without the massive volumes from Apple, it is unlikely that Samsung or later TSMC would have been able to catch up with Intel on advanced sort, not semiconductor manufacturing. I could observe this closing of the gap in logic process technology from the trenches as I had been working with the Samsung engineers in that period. 15 years later, IBM exited from the semiconductor manufacturing and their advanced power and C microprocessors are now manufactured by Samsung. Korea is like a diligent student who learned from the colonial master of Japan and even surpassed Japan in its area of expertise. Now, let us start with a short history of Taiwan till the 1960s. The Sino-Japanese War of the 1895 ended not only ended not only the Chinese influence in Korea, but also lost Taiwan to Japan as its first formal colony. After the Second World War, China was plunged into a civil war between the communist and the nationalist. It ended only by the victory of the Chinese Communist Party in 1949. The nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek fled across the Taiwan Strait with about more than 
a million of his troops and supporters. They had virtually no knowledge of or ties to Taiwan. The islanders had no political movement or armed force to challenge their role. Facing no internal opposition and having no social base within Taiwan, the nationalist mainlander government had an unusually wide room for maneuvering. This is a very unusual and perhaps unique situation in the development history of any nation. Here is a fact which may sound strange today. For many years after 1949, the only thing the Chinese Communist Party government on the mainland and the KMT Party government on Taiwan agreed on was Taiwan's status as a province of China. However, they disagreed on who was the rightful ruler for the entire China. The goal for recapturing the mainland required development of some upstream industries. But with the outbreak of Korean War, Taiwan became a key post on the West defense perimeter. In 1954, the United States undertook to assist Taiwan militarily against any communist aggression. The US used its massive aid to dissuade the Taiwan leaders from starting an assault on the mainland into which they feared the US troops would be drawn. The United States wanted a strong and stable outpost on its western defenses. And both sides wanted a showcase of non-communist development to contrast the communist development on the mainland. The UN de-organized Taiwan in 1971. Chiang Kai-shek ruled Taiwan till his death in 1975. Taiwan adopted a parliamentary form of government in the 1980s. So that was a short political history of Taiwan. Now let us see how electronics manufacturing has started in Taiwan. The origins of the electrical industry in Taiwan go back to the late 1940s, when local radio cellists began to assemble radios from imported parts. In 1950, the government began to restrict the import of the, the whole radios to give an incentive to the local assemblies. The first four-year plan indicated that the protection and other incentives would be given for the production of electrical appliances. In 1962, the government formed the state-owned television broadcasting company, which began to assemble televisions from Japanese components. In the same year, government imposed a local content requirements for the production of electrical appliances. At the start of 1960s, U.S. electrical and electronics firms began to examine opportunities for relocating production to cheaper labor sites in the Far East. Fairchild Semiconductors established an assembly and testing facility in Hong Kong in 1961. Philips opened one in Taiwan the same year. In both cases, the objective was to cut cost by moving assembly and packaging abroad. The government of Taiwan aggressively sought out U.S. companies. General Instrument was the first U.S. company to begin production in 1964. In 1966, the government published a plan to turn Taiwan into an electronics industry center. The planning agency formed an electronics working group to assist in increasing electronics production. The Vietnam War was also good for Taiwan's economy, as Korean War had earlier helped Japan's economic growth at a critical time. The United States brought large amounts of food and military equipment from Taiwan. And the island developed the best military repair facilities in Asia outside of Japan. The 1960s and 1970s saw a period of intense debate in Taiwan about the country's future and its ability to sustain a model of high-tech development without depending on multinationals or on large existing firms as in Korea or Japan. The person who is honored as a father of Taiwan's IC industry, despite having never studied, settled, or worked for pay in Taiwan is Dr. Pan Wen Yuan. He was a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford and was working as an engineer at a radio corporation of America. He co-founded the Biennial Modern Elect Engineering and Technology Seminar in 1966, where experts from chemical, electrical, civil, and mechanical engineering visited Taiwan industries, held seminars, panel discussions, and finally, recommendations were made for improvement in existing technology, engineering practices, and business processes. Industrial Technology Research Institute, ITRI, established, was established in 1973 based on one such recommendation. In 1974, PAN and the Minister of Economic Affairs, 
son, Sun Yun Sun, who, who later became the premier of Taiwan, agreed that electronics industry would be the key to Taiwan's future high tech development. And it would need a foundation in semiconductor and IC industry whose elements would have to be leveraged from abroad. The public sector was chosen as a means of Taiwan's acquisition of the new industry rather than relying on multinationals to transfer technology within their operations. This was a political choice taken at the highest level of the Taiwan government and the Kuomintang party. There was also another reason. Despite the repeated urging of the Ministry of Economic Affairs, the leading local electronics firms such as Mintak, Sampo and Tatum decided not to enter semiconductor field as they thought it as too risky. In 1974, Electronics Research and Service Organization, ERZO, was formed under ITRI with the responsibility to recruit a foreign partner to help develop and commercialize the semiconductor technology. Under PAN's influence, in 1976, RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, was prevailed upon to transfer its obsolete 7 micron CMOS technology to the ERSO for $10 million. Next, Dr. Pan recruited a cadre of 37 20 something Taiwanese electrical engineers to engage in an intensive year long training program at the RCS United States facilities. The so called RCA 37 returned to Taiwan and built a government funded chip fabrication facility. It is out of this group, the RCA 37, that virtually the entire senior management of the subsequent semiconductor industry in Taiwan was formed. In uh, 1976, ERSO opened the country's first fabrication facility, and in 1970, by 1979, ERSO was securing better yields than RCA itself. There was also a demand for a specialist knowledge intensive industry park. After overcoming considerable opposition and skepticism in the Taiwan cabinet, land was secured from the military for a new park near Sinju. Here, foreign and domestic high-tech firms operated in close proximity to the ITRI and NTHU. The government was willing to take up 49% equity in each venture. By 1980, while Taiwan had many firms engaged in the back-end IC activities such as packaging and testing, there, were, there was no LSA front-end activity. United Microelectronics Corporation, UMC, a subsidiary of ERSO was established with a 45% equity share held by five private players to commercialize advanced microelectronics technology developed in the private public research lab. Many people were transferred from ERSO to UMC. It was the first company to be located in the new Sinju Health Science Park. In 1982, UMC opened a state-of-the-art fabrication facility to make various kinds of ASICs. Application-specific IC or ASIC was chosen as it differentiated Taiwan from Korea, which was then embarking on a quite different strategy of competing against US and Japanese firms in memory chips. Taiwan did not have deep pocketed firms needed to compete the market. By late 1970s, Government officials had begun to plan an integrated information industry for Taiwan, linking semiconductors, computers, computer software, and telecommunications. In particular, ERSO was given responsibility for guiding the development of a core technologies and new products and for training microelectronics engineers. Some of them would then move to private industry. The introduction of IBM PC, which was a modular device in contrast to the vertically integrated mini computer, has resulted in the growth of PC ecosystem. There were many VLSA design spin-offs from ERSO in 1982 to 85. In 1983, the government launched an aggressive program to induce Taiwan Taiwanese professionals working abroad to return home, back home. The, na the, nationalist, the National Science Council used its four offices in the United States to build up a list of 10,000 students and employees in the high-tech fields whose skills would be of interest to Taiwan. 
it then contacted every name on that list to explain the incentives to return it kept in touch with the potential recruits and regularly reminded them of the opportunities it also administered a related program to entice taiwanese and other chinese engineers and scientists to return on short term assignments more than 3000 people returned under this scheme between 1970 and 1980 While Taiwan's chip design capabilities were leaping ahead, its fabrication facilities lagged behind. Erso could not run large volumes, and UMC is yet to upgrade a two micro, less than two micron feature size. Morris Chan, who had a long career at Texas Instruments in the United States, was recruited in 1985 to as the president of ITRI. Morris Chan broke, brought with him the concept of a silicon foundry. This was then practiced as a site plan by major semiconductor firms to use the spare capacity in building chips for third parties. Morris Chang saw that the cost of establishing wafer fabs would continue to rise, and there would be a future market for a full-time silicon foundry. Such a venture could also play a critical role in fabricating ICs for Taiwan's small chip design firms, which could not afford to build the chips themselves. An agreement was reached with Philips to start a foundry in late 1986, with the government contributing almost half of the 135 million dollar startup cost. Philips was also the leading equity holder, and it transferred its two micron CMOS technology. The new company was the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, or TSMC. The, the company decided to concentrate concentrate on ASICs. Rather than confront the Japanese and the Koreans in memories, and it will only contract manufacture these chips rather than design and market its own, so as to reduce the risk to its clients that it, uh, that it will steal proprietary knowledge contained in the chip design. Since its establishment, TSMC continued to up regularly upgrade its processor capabilities, offering. leading us and japanese firms like amd and nec and fujitsu additional foundry capacity in return in return and transfer of more advanced process technology a five year project was started by erso with private companies in the development of sub micron fabrication technology with the dram and sram as a primary test vehicle the success of the sub micron project made taiwan the fifth country in the world following united states japan germany and south korea to independently develop 16 mg dram this was the last major project of erso in the mid 1990s umc decided to become a pure play foundry its chip division was spun off as media tech in 1997 today it is one of the top 5 ic design companies of the world taiwan was also uh, was less affected by the asian financial crisis as it did, it did not liberalize the control on capital as much as korea did apple chose tsmc for manufacturing its associates in 2014 the volume from apple and other fabulous companies like nvidia amd and qualcomm enabled tsmc to leap over intel on advanced not semiconductor manufacturing in contrast to japan and korea Taiwan used the public enterprises and public laboratories to undertake big pushes in new fields. Both Taiwan and Korea used Japan as a model and used export performance as a principal source of feedback information to alter policy decisions. Having seen Korea how Korea and Taiwan developed their semiconductor industry, let us now look at the genesis of electronics manufacturing in India. India became independent after around 200 years of colonial rule. The truth was that most of the mainland India was conquered and ruled by East India Company, a corporation in the modern sense, with the aid of superior tactics and technology. This and the largely non-violent character of the freedom struggle has shaped how our founding fathers viewed the role of technology in solving India's problem of inequality and social exclusion. they also thought that production of technologies by private industries 
could result in the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a few. Had India become part of any Western military alliance like CENTO and CETO to secure technology for economic development, it would have lost its credibility among the countries who just got independence from similar colonial rule. Absorbing technology incrementally was also a politically move, political move, given India's limited foreign reserves and purchasing power. India could not afford to indulge in large-scale consumption. The available financial resources were therefore channeled towards buying capital assets to create big industrial base from which smaller sectors could be spun out. There was very little limited uh, electronic ma electronics manufacturing in India when she became independent. At that time, consumer electronics was given a low priority and was characterized in the luxury segment. In India, the demand for civilian technologies was so low that no one wanted to manufacture these components at scale. Most businesses pre preferred to import finished parts in small batches, burdening the country's external debt. The major equipment users were the All India Radio, Post and Telegraph, Defense, and their requirements were very diverse. So project proposals were invited to make radio and wireless equipment, electron tubes for professional services, and consumer products. CS of France was selected based on the proposals. Bharat Electronics Limited was formed under the Department of Defense, and it went into production in 1956. Due to our colonial past, defense services, however, defense services had been using British equipment, and hence they rejected the French components. Bell also suffered in those days due to lack of enough orders, complex procurement policy, and delay in supply. There was a new demand from the computing sector. Mahalanobis and Baba got involved in computer development activity early on. Both did so to further their respective areas of scientific research. Mahal Nobis for analysis of statistical data and BABA for nuclear research. However, electronics manufacturing got a boost from war with China in 1962, though it was not good for the nation. Suddenly, Bell's order books were full. The war with China exposed a poor level of preparedness of Indian forces, particularly the lack of modern equipment. The absence of an industrial base in strategic electronics was too glaring. Ch China ended the nuclear club, club in 1964, and India was confronted with a U.S. cutoff of electronics equipment during the 1965 Indo-Pak War. With a view to fix the type of semiconductor sh electronics shortage seen during the war with China, Prime Minister Nehru set up an electronics committee with Baba as the chairman in August 1963. The other members were Vikram Sarabhai, S. Bhagavandam, and A. S. Rao. The objective of the electronics committee was to prepare a blueprint for the planned development of electronics so that the country as a whole may become self-sufficient in this field in the shortest possible time. One of the most significant recommendations of the electronics committee was that India should avoid step-by-step -step development of electronics as seen in the advanced world and instead should leapfrog. The committee also recognized that building indigenous facility in ele electronics would also require foreign collaboration in some areas. A time frame of 10 years was given for development of an indigenous base in electronics that included R&D, design, training, and manufacturing activities. Satisfying domestic demands with a minimal reliance on foreign inputs was their aim. The Electronics Committee report, uh, Electronics Committee's final report was ready in December 1965. But before it could be formally handed over to the government, Baba was killed in an airplane cr crash on January 24, 1966. The Baba Committee report remains a constitutional document for the electronics sector in India. The Baba Committee's 1966 report advocating self-sufficiency must be seen in the context of the surrounding geopolitical events. While Baba Committee was at work, the subject of electronics had been put under the administrative control of the Department of Defense Supplies. An intense turf war started between the Atomic Energy Establishment 
and the Department of Defense to gain control over electronics. However, with the death of both Nehru and Baba, the prime movers of electronics plan, Vikram Sarabhai was appointed as the chairman of the next electronics committee. Meanwhile, production of first generation discrete devices had Bell started in 1962. In the early 1960s, Bell started production of germanium and the silicon discrete transistors. Process technology was licensed from Philips. So here is one such one product advertisement from the 1960s where in which you can see Philips is mentioned. Meanwhile, two teams, one at uh, TIFR and other at ISI uh, Jadavpur University, Calcutta, made the first made in India computing systems. Though they were not technological breakthroughs, as they were made of vacuum tubes and germanium diodes, they served the purpose of helping Indian groups gain capability in various fields of computer design, fabrication, testing, operation, maintenance and programming. So you can see here Prime Minister Nehru dedicating the TAFR automatic calculator to the nation. When the question of starting electronics manufacturing arose, the electronics division of atomic energy was spun off into an independent public enterprise called Electronics Corporation of India Limited, ECIL, in Hyderabad. When ECIL was formed, Sarabhai wanted it to be a commercial entity. He believed that export-oriented electronics development would help India close the technology gap with the advanced world. In all its computers, ECIL used indigenous components except certain integrated circuits and core memories. The ECIL team wrote all the software, including operating system software. Their EDC series established that modern digital computers could be designed and built in India, but they remained commercially not viable because one could import a corresponding machine at a much lower price. This was because the Department of Atomic Energy's emphasis on indigenous development regardless of cost. Most computers manufactured by the ECIL were supplied to the Atomic Energy and Defense and other government labs and had few commercial uses. The state became the regulator, producer and the biggest consumer of the technology, holding conflicting roles that it has yet to relinquish. Government also government turned down or set arbitrary conditions or sat for a long time on different proposals which could have brought foreign technology here. Some of them were the Fairchild CDIL plan for testing and assembly, CDC TAT and Tata on ferrite core memories, and Sony and the DCM on electronic calculators. The government established the Department of Electronics and the Electronics Commission in 1970 and 1971 respectively. MGK Menon was picked by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to head the new department. The Electronics Commission was set up as a nodal policy-making agency for the electronics industry. The Department of Electronics was supposed to approve not only a firm's entry into electronics, but any changes in the product line or increased output for an already approved product. Bell licensed IC technology from RCA in 1971 to make LSI circuits. Due to the rapid changing nature of electronics and computing technologies, it became clear that everything from design to manufacturing could not be attempted locally. The policies requiring foreign manufacturers to license patented technologies and set up local plants were initially resisted by companies such as IBM and ISL, ICL. IBM had a good run in the Indian market for two decades following its entry in 1951. Its business model was to bring in discarded or old model machines, refurbish them locally, and lease, then lease or sell them out to Indian users like railways on huge profit margins. Acts like this were exactly what our founding fathers had worried about concentrating too much power in the hands of private players. Though the Department of Atomic Energy and Statistics needed better computers, the overall political climate was not fully supportive of deploying computers for large-scale computerization for fear of loss of jobs. The actions of Department of Electronics and the Electronics Commission should be seen in, this overall, in, in the overall political and economic environment in which they operated. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi had taken a populist approach to economic policies, partly to improve her position in the Congress party following the party split in 1969. 
so that she could win the elections on her own. The foreign exchange also became very scarce following the oil shock in of 1973, and hence could not be used for importing computers. Every industrial co conglomerate had to obtain a plethora of government approvals for expanding production or establishing new capacity. Production had to be capped according to the ceiling fixed by the government. Such laws, coupled with the restrictions on foreign capital and technology, as well as high import duties on capital goods, effectively scuttled private enterprise and industrial growth. Bell and ECIL never succeeded in getting its cost down to international standards for commercial com com competition. In 1971, there were around 150 electronics licensing requests that had been outstanding for one to three years. The Department of Defense and the Department of Electronics, which had the responsibility for granting licenses, seemed reluctant to allow newcomers into the industry, even other state-owned enterprises. It seems that they were using regulatory powers to protect its privileges as a producer to ensure ECIL and Bell had no competition at the expense of industry's overall growth. The, the 1970s was truly a lost decade for electronics manufacturing. Korean industry, which was only one-fourth of the Indian electronics industry in 1965, became, became four times larger and its exports were 50 times larger as ours in 1981. Semiconductor industry is very different from others as there is a rapid technological advancement and the need for large periodical capital investment to be always at the forefront. And also, time is very critical. However, domestic market at that time and the defense requirements were too small. The only way to make up a la any huge investment was by becoming a supplier for the world as done by the companies in the East Asia. East Asia. Semiconductor, Semiconductor Complex Limited, SCL, was started in, 19, in, in 1983. 5-micron CMOS technology was licensed from American Microsystems after being denied by many others like Hitachi due to Cold War restrictions. SEL chips found an export market in East European countries and Soviet Union. SEL was not operational for many years after a tragic fire accident in 1989. It was restarted only in 1996 with a 1.2 micron CMOS technology. This chart shows how Korea and Taiwan closed the process technology gap with the leading edge companies in the early 1990s. So this left, the plot on the left is on DRAM and the right is on Logi. So I have given here SCL for comparison. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi returned to power in the 1980 general elections. A new post election policy was announced by her government on August 16, 1983. Both import and excise duties on electronics products were slashed, in some cases to zero. Large-scale large scale industries were allowed to manufacture products that were earlier reserved only for small-scale units. It became easier to import computer systems to create software for export through satellite links. The restrictive policies of the, the 1970s, however, had some unexpected fallout. Computer manufacturers were forced to invest in R&D as it was mandatory for them to invest 2% of their turnover on research. The flip side of import liberalization was erosion of technological and design capabilities gained during the 1970s and the early 80s. The flood of foreign collaborations meant and practically an end to R&D in pioneering hardware, hardware firms like DCM, HCL and Wipro, which had invested a great deal in design innovation. Local capabilities in component manufacturing were also hit due to lowering of duties on components. Imports made kit assembly operations more viable than indigenous production. This trend, however, helped in developing capabilities in systems integration and assembly operations. This virtually meant an, meant an end to indigenous research, design, and development in computer hardware and operating systems development. Computer system makers who were trying to build hardware and peripherals for mini computers were also hit by the personal computer boom and standardization. These policies also allowed multinational companies to outsource their chip design services. Texas Instruments in Bangalore and Gateway Design Automation in Noida were the pioneers in 1985. 
that's how these two regions became the chip design hubs of modern india gateway design automation was later acquired by cadence so here we look at some of our responses in the last 20 years so after many discussions government abandoned the plan to upgrade the bell facility to 0.5 micron technology in 1999 the price tag was 2000 crores the state of the art at that time was 0.13 micron bell currently manufactures electron tubes and mems components it also provides design and packaging services meanwhile a 1 micron cmos line was set up at sitha which was earlier under iti and a gallium arsenide foundry was set up in hyderabad in 1996 a bill was passed in 2000 to convert export processing zone which was not successful as intended to special economic zones in 2010 scl facility was upgraded to 0.18 micron cmos the process technology was transferred from tower semiconductors in israel there was also a boom in domestic solar manufacturing at that time India government set up a task force in 2009. They had projected that the electronic hardware imports may exceed oil by 2020. Our oil imports are still larger than electronic hardware imports. They have the task force has identified major factors which hindered the growth of electronics manufacturing in India. In 2012, the government announced a rupees 10,000 crore package in terms of subsidies and preferential market access to domestic producers. at that time 1 dollar was 53 rupees i am sure you all know what happened i am sharing the screenshot of news articles from that period quoting this article quoting from this article it took 4 years to issue a letter of intent to the two consortia and another 2 years before both backed out 10 years later let us look at the state of current india indian electronics manufacturing industry in 2019 2020 before the covid indian electronics manufacturing had reached around 75 billion dollars this amounts to around 3% share in the worldwide production in this 75 billion around 30 billion is due to mobile phones most of these mobile phones are for domestic market and rust exports to put this figure into perspective in 2018 19 china exported phones worth more than 100 billion dollars vietnam more than 35 billion dollars and india exported around less than 3 billion dollars the main obstacle for this stark difference in volumes is the production cost if the production cost of a mobile phone without subsidies is 100 then the effective cost of manufacturing in china is 79 vietnam is 89 and india is 92 now manufacturing of mobile phones in india is mostly assembly of semi knocked down or completely knocked down devices the cost can be reduced only if there is more local value addition the big question is how can we increase the local value addition and make our electronics products competitive for exports in order to answer that question we should know what the bill of materials of an electronic system depends on the semiconductor content in a modern electronic system has been increasing over the years it is over 30% it is projected that it may rise further and stabilize at around 40% this is evident from the semiconductor market size the entire electronic systems market in 2021 was around 1.8 billion dollars and the semiconductor industry was around 580 billion dollars apart from semiconductors display panels also make up a significant part of the total bill of materials of electronic products it could be 25% in the case of smartphones and over 50% in the case of lcd led tvs the worldwide display market is around 148 billion dollars now one can understand the thought process behind the recent 10 million 10 billion dollar india semiconductor mission we aim to export we aim to boost the electronics exports by by a factor of 10 in the next 5 years which is a very ambitious goal this is post, this can be possible only if there is a significant local value addition in the form of semiconductor and displays that is why as a part of ism government of india is looking to set up 
at least one semiconductor and one display fabrication facility. So in the India Semiconductor Mission is part of the Government of India's larger goal to boost Indian electronics manufacturing in 2025 to 300 billion dollars, where 120 billion dollars is expected to come from exports. This export target is 10 times higher compared to the 2020 figures. The detailed report and the plan was published by METI, the Ministry of Electronics and, uh, Info Electro Electronics and Information Technology. Let us look at some of the challenges. The, the report itself has identified some, some of the many uh, qualitative and quantitative challenges. But what was missing were the measures being taken or could be taken by governments and industry abroad. These include efforts to retain or scale up their domestic chips, chip industry for a local, independent, resilient supply chain. As well as the increased capex plans for the three main players, ESMC, Samsung and Intel. The US and the uh, uh, European Union government wanted to use this spending to claw back their lost share of the chip market. They plan to put around $100 billion and China plan to put around $150 billion in its next five-year plan. The top three players plan to spend around $30 billion each in their capex for the next year in terms of new fab and expansion of existing facilities. Some of these national aids were atta are attached with political strings that may complicate and stretch global supply chains further. We also need more integration with upstream and downstream industries, some of which are non-existent. I will speak more on this in the next slide. Finally, we may need something like an Operation Warp Drive to pull this off. There are only 18 months left till 2024, the year of Lok Sabha election. We may need a war room to coordinate, track progress and make changes as was done in General Park Changi's presidential palace during the Korea's transformation. Let me compare semiconductor manufacturing with the three other industries to look at the upstream and downstream ecosystem. I take automobile manufacturing as a benchmark which has a good number of domestic and international players in upstream and downstream. The Indian automotive industry is considered as the fifth largest in the world. Next is the solar photovoltaics manufacturing. Our solar PV cell capacity is around 3 gigawatts per year and solar PV module capacity is around 10 to 15 gigawatts per year. The lack of enough capacity and appropriate technology forces the module makers to rely on imported cells. Similar to India Semiconductor Mission, there is a PLA scheme for solar for PV manufacturing. All the big business groups in India, including Reliance, Tata and Adani, have declared their plans to set up solar fab facilities as there is a huge demand downstream. There are a lot of chip designs happening in India, both in, in, in academia as well as in industry. Estimates put that 20% of the IC designers worldwide are Indian. Almost all major semiconductor companies have design houses in India. It has been estimated that the value addition due to design activity in India is around $30 billion per year. But this is mostly due to engineering design outsourcing by multinational companies. It is true that these companies provide jobs to our students, their employees pay income tax, firms pay for utilities, rent or property tax. The total revenue from homegrown fabulous chip suppliers is only less than $50 million. The inconvenient question here is that where are the Indian equivalent of MediaTek, Novatek or Realtek? Some of the successful chip design startups in the past were sold and acquired before they became too big. When it comes to semiconductor manufacturing, the suppliers of semiconductor grade materials and gases, wafers and EDA vendors are in the upstream and domestic chip suppliers and electronic system integrators are in the downstream. This is where you need to recall the action of Korea and Taiwan to integrate semiconductor with the telecom and computer companies. There should be big customers who can use a fabrication facility. As there are no domestic chip suppliers, 
it remains to be seen what can be done to make for for example a foreign soc supplier for a domestic popular domestic cell phone or an automobile infotainment ic to manufacture it here in india it remains to be seen whether any of the big business groups will back semiconductor manufacturing as they plan to do for solar pv manufacturing let us see what history tells us about what doesn't guarantee success and instead what works since our independence we have pursued we have tried to pursue technological self reliance through import substitution under different prime ministers under different names though the objective is noble and patriotic it doesn't guarantee success unless there is a proper feedback measure like export discipline calibrate policy as was practiced in the east asian countries if the goal is to make products and hence reduce imports for a sheltered domestic market the manufacturing process may not achieve the productivity and the efficiency to compete in export markets the protection without feedback and no capability expansion only allow infant industries the luxury of never growing up and they charge consumers with the monopolistic high prices for inferior products there should be a competition among players and poor performance should be weeded out our goal should be to create a cluster of companies which can compete successfully in international markets another factor which works against india is that given co- given the complex world trade organization wto rules india's option for the type of national support for export centric policies are limited now these were earlier available to japan korea and taiwan as they nurtured and scaled up their industries in the pre wto era for example india had decided to discontinue meis its largest export promotion scheme after the wto said it distorted trade by providing direct subsidies that is why the ministry document uses the term production linked incentives pli rather than subsidies or low interest loans tied to export performance we have seen that park chunhee played a decisive role in the industrialization of south korea however one should not jump into the conclusion that authoritarianism and strong leadership are essential for any country to make a leap in the economic hierarchy mustafa kemal atatur lee kuan yew deng xiaoping and park chunhee are successful examples there are failures like mao in china ferdinand marcos in philippines suharto in indonesia and most recently rajpaksha from sri lanka it is also true that japan and korea have very high ethnic and linguistic homogeneity the counter examples i can think of are north korea egypt and portugal as plato said the measure of a man is what he does with his power for example can any of the top this big business groups in india be asked to enter semiconductor business as korea as samsung to enter electronics in the 1960s government of india has set up nano fabrication centers at premier academic institutions in the last 15 years this has resulted in impressive increase in the publications on nano electronics research in top journals like ieee electron devices letters transactions on electron devices and conferences like the international electron devices meeting in the last decade the question is how long or when will this get trickled down to form industrial activity here also academic competency is not a guarantee for industrial success for example france was the most scientific nation in the 18th century still the industrial revolution began in great britain similarly there was no dearth of expertise in physics chemistry and material science in the erstwhile ussr still it struggled in microelectronics russia's most advanced semiconductor technology today is a 90 nanometer process licensed from st microelectronics they have a long term longer term goal to establish manufacturing using a 28 nanometer node by 2030 something tsmc did in 2011 it is nearly impossible to develop an older node like 28 nanometer from a blank slate however good the academic research is the only way a nation can start is to license a mature process technology node and by hiring experienced professionals to ram the yield and run it that's the only way to rapidly master industrial and organizational knowledge and efficiency it is similar to cooking you can give someone a well equipped kitchen and an extraordinarily detailed recipe but without cooking experience it is hard to make a great dish we have seen how samsung started dram using the license technology from micron and sharp 
they hired moonlighting japanese and experienced engineers from us taiwan also had a lot of success in attracting back experienced chinese origin professionals from us the other lesser known fact is that most of the critical steps in ic manufacturing except iron implantation and some of the early eta tools came out of industrial research and not from academia if one is looking for more specific suggestions professor wade gave 10 clear and precise suggestions in his landmark book on the learnings from east asia which was published before india's liberalization there have been so many studies on east asian miracles since then this takes us to the question it takes us to what i call as the hegel's dilemma if we learn nothing from history can we learn anything from historical fiction so here i quote from gore vidal's creation there kevin atosa tells the patient diplomat cyrus pitama remember that any close companion to a great king must always tell him what he does not want to hear but must hear we have finally come to the summary semiconductors transform information technology as well as east asian economy it is interesting to recall that india korea and taiwan went through civil war or partition each of them wanted to show the world that they have chosen the right political economic system and path for national development compared to its twin sibling who followed a different ideological path korea especially had a burning nationalist desire to surpass its colonizer japan which eventually it did i am not sure whether india had something similar or even it had it looked like it was lost by the late 1960s in korea and taiwan it remained a national political goal the semiconductor industry in taiwan and korea did not simply evolve from the operations of market forces or through the decisions of multinational corporations to include them in their global production networks rather the industry was created as a deliberate series of acts of public policy by seeding and nurturing its semiconductor industry however they used different vehicles to leverage technology and finance korea and taiwan made their entry into the se se semiconductor sector via the last the most labor intensive and the least value added step in the supply chain namely the packaging of chips they later moved up to the front end wafer fabrication and associated activities of mass production wafer production and supply of specialized materials and equipment the state agencies both the technical and economic bureaucratic agencies played a huge role and they spent a lot of effort to get experienced engineers from abroad whether by moonlighting japanese engineers or experienced native from back from the us though india also had similar initial conditions india failed to grab the opportunities when it knocked at our door the manufacturing plants of fairchild ctc or sony and making ecil an export oriented economy as saramay wanted our trajectory started to drift apart in the late 1960s the the state held conflicting roles as regulator producer and the biggest consumer of technology this ensured that neither public nor private companies could reach econo economies of scale and compete in their international market in early 80s india made a course correction that unlocked software and chip design outsourcing but also kill the nascent hardware and the components industry though india has a lot of chip design professionals the absence of like a big home grown fabless company downstream is hurting our ambitions to become a big player in semiconductor we have to understand that even if we wish to follow korea and taiwan now the geopolitics of pre wto cold war era is not available now for india also thanks to the thanks to the microelectronics revolution and rise in automation assembly and packaging is no longer a labor in never intensive job as in the 1960s please note that services cannot compensate for what manufacturing should be doing at the india stage of development finally a word about china china is giving the same kind of priority it had accorded to build its nuclear capability in the 1950s and 60s to develop to develop its domestic semiconductor industry now china could be one generation behind in nan and three generations behind in logic compared to the global leaders 
our generation was not there when the first great divergence happened and there are many clear comforting but wrong answers on why it happened second divergence happened in our lifetime a faulty diagnosis of the past and a poor understanding of the present may lead to wrong prescription prescriptions for the future the prescient question staring at us these days is that are we as a nation doing everything in our capacity to prevent a third divergence would our future generations learn that the next asian miracle happened in india indonesia or vietnam these are some of some books which i recommend on great divergence if you are a beginner i suggest this first these two books okay these are some of the books on the success of korea and taiwan i recommend these two in particular and this one on the exclusively on the uh, history of semiconductor industry in the east asia okay coming to the history, on the history of electronics manufacturing in india this uh, there are no exclusive books but uh, this is a good book on the history of it india's it industry some of the early attempts of electronics manufacturing are also covered here this is a book on the history of bharat electronics limited thank you for listening i would be glad to receive your feedback